You're listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number 39. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hey everyone, welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast. I'm glad to have you here. I'm Jill Castle, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert and host of the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of raising them inside and out. I've got back to school on my mind today. My two oldest went back to college last week and my high schoolers head back to school tomorrow. Back to school always feels like the new year to me. It's a fresh start, and I don't know, I always get the bug to clean out everything, organize. I've already done my pantry. I probably will be doing my kitchen. I made all my college kids clean out their closets and donate their clothes, and I will probably be doing the same. It always just feels like a great time to, I don't know, clean up, get organized, and get ready for the fall. In today's episode, I am continuing with the theme of school lunch and tapping Brian Wansink for his perspective, particularly in the area of smarter lunchrooms. In the last episode, episode number 38, I talked with Donna Martin about school nutrition. She's done a whole lot of good stuff in her district in Georgia, One of my listeners, Diane, wrote in and said, Jill, I enjoyed this podcast, but it leaves me wondering why there is such a disparity among school districts regarding the school lunch program. I'm not seeing the positive healthy choices that Donna describes. If she saw the menu at our school in Virginia, I think she'd be as shocked as I am. Definitely no farm to table. Definitely not great selection of fruits and vegetables. One option is a cup of frozen fruit juice. Pizza twice a week, nachos, hot dogs, corn dogs, etc. It leaves me wondering how this could be and how can we change this? I hear you, Diane. My own school district has opted out of the government-based school nutrition program, so the offerings are subject to the individual in charge and not necessarily based on standardized nutrition guidelines specific to children or teens. And if you have kids in private schools, I've also seen discrepancies there in the school lunch offerings. And then, of course, as Donna mentions, some school districts are still trying to figure out how to plan and balance interesting, enticing meals within a constrained budget. What I see helping is when parents speak up and ask for something better when they partner with school nutrition and wellness committees and help with the process. I hope, at a minimum, if you're feeling frustrated with school lunch in your district, you'll share the podcast episodes in the hope of sparking some innovation in the school lunch room. I want to tell you quickly about a few things before we get started with the show. Thrive Mastermind, a pediatric nutritionist mastermind that I'm leading Uh, begins September 17th. So if you're a pediatric nutritionist and you listen to this show and you want to get ready for growth in 2018, this group mastermind will help you hit the ground running. Sign up details are linked up in the show notes over at www.jillcastle.com forward slash 039. 039, that's for episode number 39. Another announcement particularly if if you live in Connecticut. Ted X. Yay. I am so excited to share that I'll be on the TEDx stage on October 5th in Danbury, Connecticut. I'm very excited and truthfully scared uh, to finally be able to do this. It's been on my New Year's goal list since 2014. Why did it take me so long to get myself together and and apply to be on the TEDx stage? It's just mostly because it was one of those goals I was not taking action on. Mostly, again, because I was all the things that we can all be when we're scared 
to take a big step. Intimidated, not confident, not sure of how to get on, blah, 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 blah. But with the help and encouragement of a very special friend of mine, uh, it is official. I will be there. I will link up the details in the show notes. If you live in Connecticut or in the surrounding tri-state area, New Jersey, New York, maybe even Massachusetts, I would love to see you in the audience. There's nothing like a smiling, familiar face to look out on when you're on the stage. Now for the show. Today, I'm talking with Brian Wansink. Brian is the director of the Cornell University Food and Brand Lab, where he is a leading expert in changing eating behavior, both on the individual level and on a mass scale. He uses principles of behavioral science. You may be familiar with his popular books. He's the author of Mindless Eating and Slim by Design, as well as over 200 peer-reviewed journal articles. From 2007 until 2009, Brian was appointed by the White House to be the USDA's Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion Executive Director in charge of the Dietary Guidelines for 2010 and the Food Guide Pyramid. Brian graciously wrote the foreword to Fearless Feeding back in 2012, and I've enjoyed his work and his common sense application to the human dynamic around food and eating behavior. Brian and I recorded this interview last March, and since then, he has been in the news and his research has come under scrutiny. As of this podcast publication date, there have been several articles summarizing the situation, and I've included the most recent update in the show notes. Personally, I respect the public awareness and attention Brian has been able to bring to the way we eat, our food choices, and the environmental influences on eating. You can find his Smarter Lunchroom principles in schools around the country. Brian is a father to three girls, and in this episode, not only does he discuss the Smarter Lunchroom movement or how the design, flow, and layout of school lunchrooms can influence healthier food choices, he also dishes on feeding his own kids. I hope you enjoy the show. You can find today's show notes with all the links I mentioned over at jillcastle.com forward slash zero three nine. Hey, Brian, welcome to the Nourish Child podcast. Well, Jill, it's great to be with you. I'm so glad you're here. I know you're a, a very busy guy, and but I do know a lot of my listeners will be extremely excited to hear what you have to say today about smarter lunchrooms. But before we get into that, let's really talk about where we both grew up. I grew up in Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're an Iowa boy. That's right. Another I state. That's, That's right. right. That's right. I see on uh, Facebook that you're visiting your parents frequently, and maybe sometimes you take your summer break there. I'm not. That's what it seems like, anyways. Well, I mean, they're, they're 89 and 90, and we just had to put my mom in a nursing home. So you know, it's it's a it's a probably I, I fly out every other month now just to kind of make that. Uh. You know, as different as possible. Sure. Well, you're a great son. That's that's wonderful. <laughs> I, but we're going to talk about food and lunch and get into this whole uh, topic. But I, I don't know how you were brought up, but I was brought up on the meat and potato diet. It wasn't really a meal in my home unless it had meat. But my dad grew a garden and we sat at the table for dinner every single night as a family. And I have very positive you know, memories of my childhood and eating. And I also recognize as an adult, it was not perfect, but I think as many of us, we survive it and we take the good and proceed with that <laughs> and leave the bad behind. So my first question for you is, what are some of the memories of your childhood and eating? Well, you know, there, there are two of them that are linked. And I, I think I, I, I've, only, I've only mentioned this this to just a, a few people. So, uh, but, but I had this tremendously profound experience when I was about eight years old. And my idol, my brother was about six. My dad worked in a, in a, in a, a plant and, uh, you know, working in a factory. And my dad got laid off when I was maybe eight years old. And, you know, which is, which is if you're a little boy in Iowa, it's like, yes, I mean, he's around all the time. We can do stuff. And, you know, but, but it's cool for about the first two weeks. Then all of a sudden, it gets less and less cool. And I, and I noticed that one thing that was going on 
as time went on, we would go from you know eating the normal meals like the ones that you talked about to uh, we'd be eating like uh, the weirder parts of chickens, you know, like chicken gizzards and necks and the stuff that you tin, which is was, there's a little boy that's kind of cool for a while, and then then we'd be having pancakes pretty frequently for night, but like every night, and it's just like that's pretty cool if you're a little bit you're a little boy. <clears throat> and my brother, being a lot smarter than I was, kind of said, you know, I think. I think we're having some problems, and I think we're I think we're going to starve. You know, you know, he's six years old, <clears throat> and he, I remember um, one day we went to my mom and said, um, you know, mom, you know, are we? And my brother says, mom, are we going to starve? And you know, because I know dad's not working and stuff. And my mom said something that was <clears throat> really you can imagine, you know, being a mother saying this and re- having it be really well meaning, but they having it just totally backfire. My mom said, she said, oh, no. She says, if, if your dad and I only had two pieces of bread left in the house, we'd make sure that you and your brother each had a piece of bread. And, and I'm like, yes, bread. And my brother's like, ah, only two pieces. Ah. And so it, it really sort of started. I mean, and it's, I think it's the reason that I got so interested in food psychology, but it's also the reason my brother has struggled with his weight all of his life is it goes back to this 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 eight month period. And, um, I mean, after that, I mean, during that time period, we had the garden too. And then we, we, uh, had my, both my mom that had moved from the farm. So we had, we'd go back to my, uh, that aunt's and uncle's farms and get stuff. And I'd sell things door to door. And one thing I was shocked at is that if you have a wagon of gross, um, vegetables, you're taking door to door, some places will buy everything you have in your wagon and the next place, even though it's demographically different, psychosocioeconomically different, I mean, pardon me, even though it's demographically the same, and even though it's psychographically or at least socioeconomically the same, the first place could buy everything I had. The second place would say, would look at me like I had kryptonite in the wagon. <laughs> and I thought, well, what is it that causes one person to love vegetables and finish them and the next person to hate them and uh, leave them on their plate. And that's, that's basically been my career is been figuring out how the psychology of, of eating can be worked with to help people eat better, become healthier and become happier. Sure. And quite a career you've made on that uh, topic. And I, I love that topic as well. The psychology of eating. I see it in my own practice playing out with families all the time and and not only just from why they make the purchases they do or how much they eat but a lot of it in terms of parenting how they relate to their children through the process of just connecting around the table their own food attitudes their own eating behaviors and uh you know, we we have tons, and you probably know this already, we have tons of research on restriction and pressure to eat and how that affects uh, how well children eat ultimately. So I think I think the psychology of eating is, is fascinating. And you've taken that into the school lunchroom. So tell me why you think schools should be concerned with the psyche of the student. What's interesting was... I had had an incredible opportunity to be in charge of the dietary guidelines for 2007-2009. And, and I, I saw the most attempts to try to get kids to eat healthier in school lunchrooms were more like, well, if we, if we, if we teach them that cauliflower is better for them than the cookies, they'll eat more cauliflower. And it's just like, well, you know, I don't know what world you come from, but... That's not what I'm. From, that's not what I, I'm aware of. Where they would say, you know, if we if we make kids take cauliflower, they're going to eat more of it. And I thought, you know, there's there's a lot of easier ways to do this. Um, there's there's a lot of low hanging fruits in this area. And, and and simply, if you want people to take kids to take more fruit, for instance, why not put it in a nice fruit bowl right next to a light or next to the cash register instead of having it in this nasty chafer pan. It looks like a bedpan <laughs> back <laughs> line. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, it's, we had done some small studies related to this with kids and found out that it, it greatly influenced what kids took. You know, maybe in, in some cases it, it, it doubled how much fruit they took, for instance. But a lot of small changes, like giving something a cool name, calling something 
X-ray vision carrots or silly dilly green beans, again, would bump up how much kids would take by 20 to 30 percent because you, all of a sudden you made it special and different. And so we started something called the Smarter Lunchroom Movement. And the whole idea behind that was to give schools a small set of changes they could make overnight that cost them nothing that would enable them to guide kids to eat healthier without them having to have a five-hour nutrition education class, without them having to grow a school garden in the middle of the winter in Indiana or Iowa where it's not going to happen, with, without them having to have a celebrity chef come by every day. Yeah, that there's basically three things that drive children. They're, they're no different than what drive us with respect to whether we decide to choose something or not. And, and one is, is just very basically the, the convenience of something, whether it's convenient to see or to reach, whether it's convenient to think of. That's, that's why we buy combination meals a lot when we go to fast food companies. It's, it's convenient to kind of go, uh, yeah, I'll get combo number two rather than say, do I want fries? Do I, mm. Second thing ends up being the attractiveness. You know, uh, something that is in a nice bowl, for instance, is a whole lot more attractive than something that's in a chafer pan. Something that has a neat, cool little sign that says, uh, you know, whatever, uh, um, you know, uh, Tuscan, uh, fish fillet or Italian, Italian, succulent Italian fish fillet sounds a lot more attractive than someone that says fish stick. Yeah. And then normal. I mean, kids like us, they, they like, they, even though they want to be different, even though, you know, we think we want to be different. We also don't want to be weirdos. Right. And if, if there's one carton of white milk in the entire school lunchroom, you're a weirdo if you take it. And so, to make things more normal for kids, to make it more normal to have an apple on your plate, to have more normal to have white milk, because white milk is for pretty people or for strong guys, that, that ends up being the other big driver behind what kids do, as well as what we do. And so those are the things we're, we're, we're looking, looking at. Mm -hmm. I just had a conversation with somebody last night, um, an integrative physician, I, we were both presenting at a, a high school career night, and we were commenting about teenagers and how they're almost like toddlers and in, in a way because uh, they're lazy. And so if you put the bowl of fruit out on the kitchen counter and it's chopped up, they'll eat it. They'll eat whatever is right there, but they will definitely go for the low-hanging fruit, if you will. And uh, I think that's another thing that we – we forget that, you know, kids are, you know, motivated by different things. And, and if you can tap into that, uh, you can really change their behavior. And they're not necessarily motivated by telling them what to do. You know, that's exactly right. But, you know, the interesting thing is, is almost anything we do in our home for kids is also going to work for us. You know, so it's interesting you mentioned that kids are more likely to take cut up fruit yeah, so we did, we've done stuff and we found that kids are about 42% more likely to take food that's been, uh, fruit that's been cut up, okay? But, but we find adults are about 73% more likely to take fruit that's been cut, cut up. up. Mm. So almost anything we do, to, almost anything we set up to help our children eat better at home, for instance, is going to have the same impact on us. Yeah, I find that all the time. With, yeah. with just parents and, and helping them with their children. So in the school uh, lunchroom situation, can, can you outline, I know you mentioned giving interesting names to vegetables um, and where you position food to increase the likelihood that children will choose those foods. Are there other um, examples of, of what schools can do to make their school lunchroom smarter? Yeah, exactly. In fact, what we, what we found is we found, uh, initially we found 100, this is based on our research and other people's research, we found 100 things that could be done that guided, that could guide kids to eat healthier and choose healthier things. And we had a scorecard, it's called the Smarter Lunchroom Movement. You, 
you go to smarterlunchroom.org, you can download the scorecard. And it's one that the U.S. Department of Agriculture uses, the USDA uses when it encourages uh, people to do things. But we've changed that from 100 items down to about 60 items. And the 60 items are focused very specifically on, on the things that schools want to get kids to eat more of. So, for instance, um, getting kids to drink more white milk. And getting kids to eat more fruit, more vegetables, more of a targeted entree, you know, like a, a vegetarian burrito, and things like this. And so, for each of those items, let's say, let's say, let's say milk, for instance, there will be a number of a number of things, a number of actions that a school could take. Most of them, almost most of them, would cost no money at all to change, and most of them could be done overnight or over a weekend or over a break. But it'd be something like you know, we found that. Milk, um, the selection of white milk goes up uh, about 35% if you put milk in the very front of the milk case and white milk in the front and the milk case and not in the back. Um, that's an easy fix. We found that if, if at least half of all the milk is white, you again, you sell about 38% more milk. So all of a sudden, it's not a weird thing to take because people must be taking it because it's at least half the milk. Mm hmm. We find that if milk's in every one of the every one of the coolers, and again in the front of every cooler, again it goes up another thirty percent. Now those aren't cumulative, but those each of those individually will will bump sales up or selection up quite a bit. So that's those are some examples. And again, the scorecard you, you can print it down. We've got twenty nine thousand schools at last count that have used some or part of. Uh, the scorecard and figuring out how to change their school interims. Mm, that's great. And are you looking at outcomes data on those schools? Yeah, yeah, we are. Now, the way we're, we're kind of doing it is we have, we have outcome data from, a, from another sort of survey that's done outcome data and then also data on like test performance and stuff like this. And what we're doing is we're, we're joining it. We find which schools have implemented the smarter lunchroom movement. And then we also look at what schools, what, um, we, we tried to link that up with their outcome data. And it's just something we started uh, about six weeks ago when we got this new data set. So we don't know, we don't know yet the outcome, but, and, and part of that gets messy because kids are growing and, and they say, and they say, we moved a fruit bowl and BMI decreased by 2%. Well, that had nothing to do with the fruit bowl. I guarantee you. <laughs> it, had, it had to do with the fact that you were going through growth spurts or, I don't know that a new gym class was offered or something, but but we are kind of trying to link these up to some general things. Sure, sure. Well, I'm sure you could link it to sales as well, just total well, income. That's the big thing. That's the big thing we're able to link it up to, and that, that's where we find sales and waste. And, and, the, and the bad thing is if you increase how much fruit people take or vegetables people take, it also increases the amount of waste. But one of the things that we find that if you – if you get a kid to take cauliflower on his own accord, he might waste some cauliflower, but he's going to eat a whole lot more of it than if you just plop it on his plate. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I don't know why I'm beating up on cauliflower. I mean, I should, you know, I should, be, I should beat up on eggplant because that's the one thing in the world I do not like is eggplant. So. <laughs> uh, well, I, there are a lot of things I don't like, but sometimes I eat them just because I know they're good for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do your uh, you have children? Do they eat in the school lunchroom? Yeah, uh, they they eat about two days a week in the school lunchroom, and I I also my, my I, I I'm really fortunate. My my wife has always been an off scale cook, and then she went to Le Cordon Bleu yeah. and here <laughs> came and became an out, an outstanding cook times one one thousand, and so she, she three days a week she she makes. Um, lunches for the kids right the other two days they eat, they eat there yeah yeah that's that's pretty much what i do too i i uh my kids eat twice a week in the uh school lunchroom sometimes more if i'm busy or traveling or dad's in charge then they definitely eat more <laughs> <laughs> Those are usually, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not that i'm throwing my husband under the bus or anything but uh it's bit you know <laughs> two working parents it's pretty busy so yeah and I, I have my youngest is a boy, and I do end up talking about him a lot on the show. He probably is going to hate me for that, but he's in a huge growth spurt now. So we're doing the whole two sandwiches, 
you know, two pieces of fruit, two, two things of dairy. He's, you know, and he'll come home and you say, Mom, I ate it all. So I'd much rather be having him, I don't know, I, 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 not that I'd rather him eating those things, but it's just, it's less expensive for me to have, to be able to send uh, his lunch than him buying two, you know, two entrees at the school or whatever. You know, that's interesting you say that. And if I can take just a, a departure for just, just a, a quick second. Sure. You know, this, 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 the idea about about school lunches or the idea about lunches in general, it's kind of neat. But, you know, I've talked to all these parents, people who, you know, kind of who maybe when they're in their, in their 20s or whatever, really believe that they would be they, they would be that, that incredible 45-year-old or 50-year-old having this just incredible lifestyle, a really empowered, amazing, creative, satisfying lifestyle. And, and they find themselves, they have kids, and all of a sudden things kind of fall in a rut. The excitement's gone. They don't feel like the 27-year-old they once were. And I really believe this food that we're talking about right now ends up being almost a self-improvement avenue that can get a lot of parents back to kind of what they're thinking about. And let's, let's even take the, you're, you're not feeling appreciated, you're not feeling creative. And if we even take something like, like, um, like, like lunches in the morning, that one of the things that, that I've started doing for the kids when they have lunches occasionally, like maybe twice a week, is I'll put something in the lunch, some sort of stupid surprise. I mean, it could just be like a little note that says, you know, I love you, you're awesome, and, or whatever. Or it could be putting out a stupid joke, or it could be taking a piece of le- two pieces of Lego and putting their name on it so they have to figure out how to put it together. But just something stupid for their lunch. And, and I find that even though you say, well, God, I mean, how would a teenager feel about that? You know, they almost always comment that either they thought it was cool or somebody commented on it or they make fun of it. And it makes me feel incredibly creative in the morning. But it also makes me feel incredibly appreciated when they come back and they make some comment about what happened that day. That, you know, boy, Christina said that she really wished that her dad um, put three M&Ms in, her, in the bottom of her lunch bag. You know, and I think that there's a, that, that being a parent with kids, there's a lot of ways in child nutrition that we can use that as an avenue for our own self-renewal. Mm. And then typically what we don't, we don't, we typically say, oh, I'm making a stupid lunch for the kids. Oh my God, my life is falling apart. Or, you know, another dinner where things are just going haywire. Oh my God, I've got dishes to do. But I think those are all tremendous avenues. And that's a lot of what our research is doing. And that's, that's actually where I'm, where I'm, where I'm gearing my next book is, is how we can use that as a, as a way for renewal personally for ourselves. Mm, that's very interesting. Um, I love that idea because I think you're really talking about a mind shift and uh, in a way, behavior shift obviously too, but a mind shift that you know feeding kids is not this drudgery and chore that we have to do as parents. It actually can be quite a, a great source of joy and connection with our kids. So I love that idea. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of stu- like he's kind of stupid today, but you know, um, their lunch is made for him, and I had been somewhere I, I can't remember where on Monday or so, and I had brought back. I mean, uh, this is <laughs> this is ridiculous. Like you know, like hotel soaps mm-hmm. or you know, uh, lotions, and and I just took a little label maker and put their name, you know. Audrey and put it on the little hotel soap and dropped in their lunch. <laughs> now that's pretty stupid. That's cute. I, you know, yeah. When and I, I thought it was kind of fun. It made me feel happy when I did it. And I know she's gonna, she's gonna say something tonight. Roll her eyes. Uh-huh. She'll find, she'll find how fun it notable. So I think that there's a lot of ways that we can take something that we resent doing or we don't like doing rather, and we can try to turn it around. Mm-hmm. You know, not not just get benefit our kids, but benefit us. And that's a lot of the stuff that, that when you talked about cut fruit, most of the stuff that we do help our kids eat better is also going to help us eat better. So it's totally win-win. Yeah. Yeah. I just had a client uh, recently who, uh, after our first session, we, we came back for our second session and she looked at me and she said, okay, I'm a neglectful parent. I've been a neglectful feeder. So I've been doing all this structure and balanced meals and doing everything you told me and 
that's all we started with. And she said, this is so much work. I have not been doing this forever. And of course, her kids are, are, are really picky and they have a little bit of a challenge with their weight. And, and, and I, I said, you know, feeding can be hard. It's a job, but it doesn't have to be, you know, something that catches up to you and is just overwhelmingly difficult. You I, I think as a society, and I'm here, I'm getting off a little bit on a, on a tangent here, and I'm interested in, in knowing what you think about this, but I think as a society, we, we unfortunately don't prepare our parents for the job of feeding their children. We, we give them all this education and weeks of preparation to go and birth a baby, and then we say, see ya, go raise that child. Uh, you get, you know, six checkups in the first year of life, but then you're on your own. And I think we do such a disservice to our parents in that light because they are inevitably going to run into challenges. <laughs> no, that, no, that, that's exactly. And, and, and I think that the harder we make it for people, the, the, you know, the, the more they're just going to throw up their hands and say, okay, we're, we're having pizza again tonight. And, and starting slow with, with something ends up even being – uh, you know, just a great thing to do. So, and one, one thing we found, I mean, <clears throat> this is, this is, this is again, kind of crazy, but, but we found that, um, that in this one, in, if, if you look at people that their mood ends up influencing how, how, how they, what they choose to eat and what they eat. And one of the things that we, we, we did with people is we had them before they were to choose snacks and then before they were to order, order lunch, we had them write down one thing that they were thankful about, one thing they were thankful about that happened that day. And most of these ha- are lunch experiments. So, you know, with undergraduates, they've, you know, they've been up for about 45 minutes. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> Barely. Yeah, that's right. And they might say something like, "Well, you know, I guess I'm 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 grateful that I wasn't hit by a bus yet today." Okay, <laughs> but simply stating something they are grateful for ended up uh, leading them to choose <clears throat> uh, lunches that were just a little bit healthier, uh, just a little bit lower in calories, about about nine uh, percent lower in calories, but a little bit healthier mix. Just by saying, "What's one thing that happened that I'm actually grateful for?" Because you say what you're kind of grateful for, we are it puts you in a better mood. And and one of the things that we found that's a that that we've been experimenting with with some parents of kids is having them go around a table and saying what's a high point that happened today and what's a low point. Mm-hmm. And we find that structuring a meal like that benefits people in a number of ways. In that, first of all, you kind of know what your kids are doing, and they know that your life isn't all just you know, roses and sunshine. Right. But what, strangely enough, some parents have reported is now that their meal time has a little bit more structure, they, they put a little more thought into what they serve. Mm-hmm. Now, we, we didn't give them guidelines that say, here, you have to have seven food groups and stuff like this. We just said, do this at the beginning of the meal. And it's almost a, that doing a little exercise like that makes it, meal seem a little more important in people's minds. So as a result, they heat up a can of peas, whereas they wouldn't have done that before. Mm-hmm. And I think some of these, some, you know, making these meals more of an event or appear more meaningful might be one avenue to get people to think healthier about it rather than to send them to um, Le Cordon Bleu. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so almost, it, it almost sounds like it's a smarter family table. Well, that's exactly what, you know, so we did this, we did this really cool, we did this really neat study a while back, and it's, it's not been cited very much, but it's one of my favorite, and that one of the things we did is we, 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 we took people, and we, we described this woman, Valerie, and Valerie's, you know, she's working all day, she comes home, and she makes dinner for the kids, and then they go to bed and stuff, but, you know, it describes the dinner she made, and, and we say something like that, and she, you know, she warmed up pasta, some leftover pasta. She made some chicken and they had, um, you know, bread and milk. Okay. Half the people read this scenario of, of Valerie. The other half read the exact same scenario of Valerie, the exact same thing, same page, everything. But for dinner, she said, and Valerie, you know, she warmed up some leftover, um, 
pasta from the night before. She made some chicken. She had some bread. And then we say, and she um, defrosted um, some frozen green beans. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then we ask people to describe what Valerie's like. Well, in, in the case where Valerie doesn't serve the vegetable people said well she's you know a rushed woman she's kind of selfish she's it's all about her you know she's uh you know um and, and it wasn't positive things but but it when we simply changed one phrase that said and she defrosted some green beans or she added some green beans all of a sudden the perception of valerie was this is a this is a a, a thoughtful woman she's a loving mom she's a hard worker and it totally changed perceptions of what this person did, even though there's no indication whether anybody even ate the silly green beans. Mm-hmm. And, so interesting. Well, you know, and what, when that happened, and I, and I thought, you know, so I only make one meal dinner a week, and of course it's the worst one. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Who says? It, yeah, that's right. Uh, that's consensus. <laughs> as long as there are little bottles of soap at the dinner table. <laughs> With their names on it, I'm sure it's all fine. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah, and so you know, once we discovered that that one thing that happens is that if you serve a vegetable, people see you as a love, a more loving, thoughtful parent. Holy cow! I mean, within 48 hours, I change the way I make dinner. I make sure there's a vegetable because if they if they're going to think if there's even a small chance they're going to think I'm a better dad or a more loving parent because I defrosted some green beans that's a done deal yeah and and i think for your friend to say oh my gosh this is just a lot of work well she may not want to read that journal article but you know you can say you can say this changes the perception of how your family views you as a person if you just add that one extra thing even if it's a warm-up can of peas that nobody eats it changes how they view you. And that is the motivating thing for parents, I believe. Yeah. For some parents. Yeah. I think that that's a great point. And actually, to, to sort of close the circle on that person, what I failed to mention was that she said she was eating better, that she felt healthier, and she herself was benefiting from meal planning and, and eating in a structured, balanced way uh, that she was trying to do for her own children, she was actually doing it for herself as well. So again, too, just there are lots of benefits. We just have to discover them. And I think what you do so, so well in your work is prove it. Like almost a, a lot of times what we intuitively know to be true, you prove it in your research, which is which is great. And you're making new connections, which are are powerful, powerful motivators for parents. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I, we try to set everything up so that there's always sort of a solution. There's a news you can use solution to a, to a problem. And then and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't work. But it, it, it works a lot better than kind of keeping along the same track that we were on in the 1940s. Right. It is it is fascinating to watch nutrition Eat it. evolve. That's right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh boy. And I think uh, unfortunately a lot of us as adults are still sort of recovering from the eat it, clean your plate phase. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, let me tell you something really kind of cool about that. We we did <clears throat> we did the study that we published a while back which which you know, cuz you have people say, "Well, you know, the reason why I'm overweight is I'm part of the clean plate club." And these they sound it they they say it like, you know, like they're one of like four people in the universe. Well, so, so we've we've taken all of our research on clean plate stuff and and we've taken all of our studies and we looked, hey, on average when people serve themselves, okay, not when they're eating at, you know, I don't know, some restaurant, but when they serve themselves, how much do they eat? And we find that typical adult, regardless of whether they're from Taiwan or from from Tijuana, it ends up eating about 92% of everything they serve. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, unfortunately, if something around you, like the person next to you or the side of your plate causes you to serve too much, you're going to eat too much. But what we found with kids is interesting. And this is a much smaller sample. This is probably only about two or 300 kids. But, but we found the typical kid, and I'm talking like, you know, like a 5 to 12-year-old, only eats about 60% of what they serve themselves if their parent isn't there. Hmm. You know, and, and I remember finding this and kind of going, you know, this is really important because what it says 
to, to us as parents is that if your kid isn't eating everything on their plate, it doesn't mean they're wasteful. It doesn't mean they're defiant or they don't like you. It really just means they're normal. Mm-hmm. And if you say, why then would a kid not eat everything when I put it on the plate and I tell them to do it? It's like, or, or I'm rather, when they serve themselves, why, don't, why wouldn't they eat everything they serve themselves? It's like, well, unlike you and I, we roughly know or roughly calibrated to know how much we think it's going to take to fill us up. Well, they're not. Right. Okay? Um, and unlike you and I, we're roughly calibrated to know what we like and don't like. I mean, I know I don't <laughs> like um, <laughs> you know, that one vegetable. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I never, so I don't ever take it right. unless it's to make somebody else happy. Um, but but they don't. And so I, this was a huge breakthrough for me as a parent too, because. I immediately stopped saying, Audrey, finish your, you know, finish your cauliflower. You know, I would just say, well, you know, she ate about half of her plate and that's about average for kids. Mm-hmm. And I think that's empowering for us to know as parents because it makes us beat ourselves up less also. Right, right. Well, and I think too, you know, having kids serve themselves. What do you think about that? Do you, do your children, do you ever do family style meals and, and let the kids... <laughs> Pick and choose and serve uh, themselves. Only, yeah, well, yeah. Only the second time around, t- typically we'll serve everything for them. And I, I know there's, there's, I know there's different, there's different views about, you know, we, 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 you know, parents decide what they decide how much, but, but we usually serve it for them. And then the second time around, they they get to have whatever they want. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One one important point is is we'll often run into parents and say, yeah, you know, I just can't get my kids to eat. Eat their vegetables. I just can't do it. They're not vegetable lovers. And I'll say, well, let's talk about let's let's talk about what happened today. And they'll say, well, okay, my kids come home and you know they're hungry because they're growing. So you know, I give them this incredible snack. You know, they I don't know, ice cream or bugles or whatever. They they give them this massive snack, and all of a sudden, you know, the uh, kind of the morning lights going off. This kind of says, well, maybe that's why they're not eating their vegetables. It's because they're not hungry at all. But they say, okay, well, aside from that. What happens on the days that you don't give them this, you know, snack to end all snacks? And they'll say, well, they, you know, they sit down and we serve it and they just don't take any vegetables. And, you know, you say, well, what, what do you do when there's salad, there's cauliflower, there's pasta, and there's chicken in front of you? What, what are you going to take? Well, I, you know, it's probably less likely to be the salad and the cauliflower because it's going to suffer in comparison. So one thing that we recommend, and actually slimbydesign.com has a bunch of things that can be published but or printed off. But one of the things we have is, a, is just a simple scorecard for your own home is if you serve vegetables and salad first before you bring out the starch and the meat, you're on average, going to end up eating a lot healthier than if you bring it all out at the same time. And, and that's where us as parents really mess up a lot. We'll just serve everything at once. And then we wonder why the kids just don't want to eat pasta and chicken. Right, right. That's actually a tip I give to my clients all the time. Just play restaurant. They always serve the salad first. So serve yeah, the salad first. Yeah, great. Yep, that's yeah. great. So yeah, how, how do they how do they respond to that? Is that easy for them to implement? Yeah, it is. And they're always, you know, I always think it's fascinating when you to me this is a simple suggestion and and a, a no-brainer, but it's very eye-opening for a lot of parents because you know, uh their kids do come to the table, so, you know, hungry oftentimes, and if you do serve salad or or raw veggies and and dip, uh they will eat those things first and then serve the meal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. great. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so Smarter Lunchrooms is is wrapping up with more outcome data research. What's next for you, Brian? Well, you know, that's interesting you ask that. And one thing that um, <clears throat> we're doing is, is developing something that people can, can actually work in the home, that they can, they can actually implement in the home. And so part of it's it's based on, taking these concepts that were in the smart lunchroom, but then moving them to home. So I I had a a book that came out last year called Slim by Design, which looked at how you can do things in your your home and 
how things can be done in restaurants, grocery stores, workplaces, and schools. And part of that is to make it easier for, for parents. So like it's one thing I've been working on uh, most of the, the last semester uh, is, is an app that a person can download that lets them just go and score their home and see whether it's making them healthy or whether it's making them heavy. But it also says, hey, here's exactly what you need to change. If you're serving off of plates that are either larger than 12 inches or pardon me, larger than 10 inches or they're smaller than 9 inches, Look, try to change that because you're unknowingly over-serving when you serve yourself or you're going back too many times. You know, if, if you're serving pasta right off the table in front of you, uh, you're going to eat 20% more than if it's uh, over on the counter just four feet away where you have to get up for seconds and thirds and fourths. And so, so making, giving people the same sort of scorecard idea that's worked so well for schools when they look at their home, I think has been pretty motivating for some people. So that's one thing I'm working on. And then the second thing is looking at how we can help empower parents to have, you know, <clears throat> to feel more alive, to feel more self-actualized, to feel more like that 27 year old that we, we, we want to be inside, but we don't see in the mirror and we don't feel like in the mirror and, and to, how to do that through um, our family and the way we feed our kids and ourselves. And mm -hmm. like some of the things I was talking about earlier about <clears throat> simply, you know, occasionally once, once a week or so putting something silly in the lunchbox where they come back and they appreciate it. We feel appreciated. We feel creative. You know, they feel special. Oh, look, that's a small step in the direction. Sure. Look at, you know, looking at high points and low points at dinner time and going around. There's another step. All of a sudden, you know what your kids are doing. You know what your spouse, a little bit more about your spouse rather than how the day go. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so look at, looking in that direction, looking at how we can use food and, and meals with our children to empower us as parents to be, again, that 27-year-old we all want to think we are in our heart of hearts. <laughs> right, 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 right. Goodness, I wish. <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you've been such a great, uh, resource and interview. You're always, so you have such an interesting perspective and down to earth, real, realistic, uh, practical take on things. <laughs> I think the listeners will just love this. I know I have. And, uh, where can everyone find you and your work? Well, you know, you can find more at, uh, slimbydesign.com, slimbydesign.com. And there's a brainwansing.com, but that, that tends to be more crazy other stuff. It's that if you're interested mainly in how to feed your kids better and eat better and try to be happy and healthier, slimbydesign.com. Awesome. Wonderful. Brian, thank you so much for your time today. And yeah, I will include yeah. Yeah, all your links in the show notes so everybody can uh, go check you out. And I can't wait for your book to come around. Have an awesome okay. day, Brian. Thanks yeah, so much. Absolutely. Okay, okay. We'll see you now. Okay, bye-bye. Well, there you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed the show today with Brian Wansink talking about smarter lunchrooms and much, much more. Do you have feedback or comments? If you do, go to the show notes and leave them there. I'll respond, and you might even be highlighted here on the show in the future. I ask everybody who listens to the show to help the Nourish Child podcast grow. You can do that by writing a review on iTunes. That helps other parents, professionals, and just people in general be able to find the show quickly when they look for nutrition and children. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Android, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, Tuned In, and more. The links are in the show notes, easy for you to do. You can easily, easily also just go to iTunes and type in the search box, The Nourished Child. My show will pop up. You click on the colorful icon, and it will allow you to subscribe to the show. What that means, it doesn't cost you anything. It's free. All it means is that when you are subscribed to the Nourish Child podcast, you get an automatic download onto your device every time a new show publishes. So you never really have to go searching for it again. It just magically appears. If you haven't joined the Nourish Child Facebook page, 
It Is Time. That's my hub for the podcast and for the Nourish Child blog updates, plus a whole lot more. As always, thank you for joining me today. I'm always so glad you're here with me. Please be sure to give the child in your life, big or small, a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out. 